Fast forward from November 2018 to April 2020. So the first time I tried to get off of birth control was April 2018. Now it's April 2020. I'm back home in the DC, Maryland area. I'm actually going to start medical school later that year. And I decide again, okay, I'm about to start my fitness journey again. I'm about to get on my nutrition like super tight. And I'm going to try to figure out this thing with my reproductive mess. I'm going to be in a better place for it. Um, and I really, really was. I was like the healthiest I'd ever been mentally, spiritually, emotionally. Like I was 2020 literally from January to July when I started school was the best overall health I had like just ever been in. I was so happy. I actually had a lot of really, really good luck coming off of birth control too. And I think a lot of that had to do with just like minimal stress even though i was like literally working almost like 12 hours a day and getting in um working out and eating a minimum of like 2500 calories a day because i was gaining and um i was like very very busy but it wasn't like a stressful busy it was like a i'm just feeling my time trying to be the best that i can be um take the best the most opportunities i can i was trying to work and save up money to pay off like school debt interest and just I just had a vision and I was just like going for it so um I actually had a really good experience coming out from my birth control but I did notice that my cycles were still a little bit long um again I never had any like crazy bleeding like my bleeding was probably sometimes I think it's considered moderate but I think I might even be light to moderate um for bleeding I didn't have crazy crazy pain or anything like that um, they were just a little bit long. My cycles, um, and I can also show you guys that too. My cycles were pretty much anywhere from like 35 to 37 days, um, which for me, I was like, dang, okay, 35 is considered the last day to be normal. So 35 is like, what? Um, and I was sitting at 35 to 37. So I was kind of like, eh, okay, you know, I'm just going to keep watch for it. It's not like the end of the world, but I'm just going to, you know, just keep my eye on it and make sure everything's good. Um, and slowly but surely that number actually started to become more normal until my average was actually around 35. I think 35 became my average and I was like, okay, well, at least I'm within a normal window, even though I don't know if there's a big difference between 35 and 37. I don't know, but like it made me feel good knowing that I was considered normal so um one important thing that made me also feel a little bit better about my long cycles is that they were abnormal but regular and what that means is when you're irregular that means you might have a period after 28 days then you might have it after 32 then you might have it after 24 and it's just like all over the place to where your body isn't seeming like it's on a clock so that's irregularity but um abnormality would be your cycles are too short so like under less than 21 days or too long over 35 days so even though i had um abnormal long cycles for most of that time they were regular and that made me feel like normal because it would go from like i started out with 37 then it inched to 36 then it inched to 35 so it was kind of like a stepwise process um so pretty much all of 2020 my cycles were um they got to the point where they were like 35 days apart and that was my norm. Um, so yeah, so I took a little bit of a break, but let me get back to it. So I was talking about 2020. So yeah, 2020 had gotten off the birth control. Things were cool. Um, cycles were getting shorter. It looked good. Fast forward to December of 2020. I um, This was about, I actually need to look on my app. Dang, I could probably have it here, but I, I'm recording on my phone, so I can't see it. But um, this was maybe like a week or a week and a half after my period. 
I started having cramping on my left side. And at first I was kind of, it was kind of weird because I was like, at this point, I know I'm not ovulating because I don't even ovulate at the two week mark. Because remember my cycles are long and your cycle length is based off of when you ovulate, when you're gonna release that egg that we talked about earlier. So being that my cycles are long, I usually don't even ovulate until like the third week. So I was just like, for me to ovulate, even if I did early, to ovulate at a week or a week and a half would be ridiculous. So, you know, like I, I remember thinking about that, but it wasn't like that big of a deal. It's not like I was in pain, it was just like cramping. So that started that morning, but slowly, and surely, as the day went on, it like kept getting worse and worse and worse. And by that time at night, I don't know what time it was, maybe it was around like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, I started having severe pain. And it came on like that. Like it, um, it started with that cramping feeling. Honestly, I can't even tell you what happened in the time between, but it got to the point where I was at 10 out of 10 out of pain. Like I was switching between eight out of 10 up to 10 out of 10. Um, and it started out, it was pretty much all on my left side. There was like, my right side was okay, but my left side was hurting so bad. I couldn't like lay on it. I couldn't lean towards it. Um, it almost felt like stabbing, burning, cramping all up, like from basically my hip where your ovary would be like my hip groin area all the way up to where my kidneys were. And I was really thinking, do I have some type of like crazy infection or something like that to the point where like that whole side of my body was in crazy pain. It was radiating, it was so, 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 so bad. And um, I remember at one time I tried to get off the bed, which was hard enough because I had to use the bathroom, unfortunately. And I literally almost blacked out. I almost blacked out getting out of the bed. I almost blacked out walking to the toilet. I almost blacked out on the toilet, if not actually blacked out, but I didn't, at no point in time was I like out for a long period of time, but I think I do remember like a flash going by when I was on the toilet. And this whole time I was on FaceTime because unfortunately I was visiting my um, mom in North Carolina with like my younger sisters and th where they live is basically like in the middle of nowhere. And the health system there is like scary. I'm just gonna say that like I did not want to go to the hospital on top of that it was like peak COVID time because it's December 2020 it's like peak COVID I'm in a very very small town in the south where people are absolutely not believing in wearing masks like literally the local sheriffs of the county said we're not going to enforce the state mask law um, which is a whole other issue regardless of whether you believe in wearing masks or not being a criminal so it's like a totally different issue so if your state says that this is like a mandatory legal requirement then you as law enforcement that is literally your job is just to enforce the law like I don't really care like any about any of the nuance that's your literal job is to enforce law hence law enforcement so i just thought that was weird but that's a whole other separate like thing but you know it was just like peak time um with the virus and everything that was going on so i didn't feel comfortable going to that healthcare system and on top of that i didn't have any way to get there so the only person in the house was actually one of my sisters and she literally had a one month old baby newborn my niece was one month old um, she had already, I think the day before that, coincidentally, the like day before that, she had had like um, like a medical emergency, like just from after labor and like having issues and stuff like that. So I didn't want to bother her at all. So I was just staying on FaceTime and um, I was just like pushing through it. And at, the, at some point it got so, so, so bad that I was thinking, okay, maybe I have to call the ambulance and go. And I told myself, I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna wait. And if it goes down a little bit, I was like, as long as it's like an eight out of 10, I can do it. If it gets a 10 out of 10, I will go to the hospital. But fortunately for me, after it reached that super severe point, it did stay at like an eight out of 10 and I breathed through it. And then about maybe around two, three o'clock in the morning, I was finally able to go to sleep. And unfortunately I do remember it was, um, I did have two finals the next day um because i was still in med school at this time and i was able to take like one of them because i, I kind of made a deal with my deans and i was like i can take the easy one when i wake up in the morning because i can take that one off of no sleep because i'm very visual so i was like i could take the lab exam 
with that happening as long as I feel okay when I wake up in the morning, but I'm not gonna be able to take the lecture exam because I already struggle kind of sometimes with like reading a little bit, especially if I'm under pressure. Sometimes I'll read things kind of backwards or I'll like switch things in my head um, or I'll have to keep rereading over and over. So I was like, I don't wanna take a lecture exam. But it also sucked because I was traveling the next day too. I was going from North Carolina traveling to Texas. So it was a lot going on, but I was fortunate enough that when I did wake up, I slept. So I slept from like two or three to like six or seven. And I woke up and believe it or not, besides being extremely tired, like I had no pain, like no actual pain. Um, so I woke up, I talked to the deans again. And I was like, I can still take my lab exam, but I can take my lecture exam, but I'm, I'm also traveling tomorrow. So if you need me to take it tomorrow, I can, but it might have to be in the evening or like, you know, I'll have to literally get on my flight, get settled, go to where I need to go and take the exam there. But I was able to work everything out. But what I did that next morning is I did a virtual appointment with, I think it was an internal medicine doctor because um, just as proof, since I didn't go to like the ER, I didn't call an ambulance or anything like that. I still needed like some documentation for me to like move my exam back. So I did like a virtual appointment through like our school. They have like a telehealth thing. And what's so crazy is I told this man, it was a, it was a MD internal medicine doc. I told him the severity of my symptoms. I told him that it was about a week or a week and a half af from my period. At that point, I would have known the exact date. And I told him everything that happened. And he literally said, I think it's probably PMS like type stuff. Y'all, at this point, I'm, so I'm about to be 29 in August of this year. So at this point, I'm like, what, 26? And I'm like, I'm 26. I've had periods for 12 years, minus the ones I skipped on birth control. Um, and you're telling me that me feeling like my kidney was going to shake out of my body because I was in that much pain all up and down my left side that it's PMS. I was literally blacking out 10 out of 10 pain and my pain tolerance ain't no joke. 10 out of 10 pain and it's PMS. And it's like, this is the reason why women with endometriosis go undiagnosed for decades or more and are in pain and have no freaking idea that the pain that they're going through is not normal. It's because of stuff like that. Granted, I don't know if it would have been different if it was like an in-person appointment, but you have got to be kidding me. So I move along because again, I still have my final the next day. I'm still traveling from North Carolina to Texas the next day. Like I don't have time for this. So, you know, I literally keep it moving. It is what it is. But um, what I do is I start planning for, okay, now I'm going to go see um, my OBGYN, not the one that I had before. So like the one that I had um, before, like when I was living in DC, Maryland, but before I moved to Texas, I actually couldn't see her when I got back because I used to have military insurance and I don't have it anymore. And she's a military provider. So I couldn't see her. So I had to find another gynecologist. So I found one that I really, really liked. Lord bless her because her office staff is like some of the worst I've ever seen. But she herself is such a good physician that I, it's a struggle, <laughs> but, but I go to her because I really like her. Every other person in her office, that's a different story. But anyway, so I go to her and this is in April of 2021. Because when this stuff happened in December of 2020, it was in the beginning of December and I actually had um, break. I was in Texas from like all of December and pretty much like probably half of January. And I did my regular exam with her office, but I had to schedule a different exam for the actual ultrasound. So it ended up being like April that I was able to get the ultrasound. So I finally get in there to get the ultrasound and I'm going to also put the results up there for you guys. And this was really, really cool because at this point I am 
almost done with my first year of medical school. Like I've gone through reproductive. Actually, I think we were either, dang, we might've been just about to start reproductive or we were starting reproductive, um, the section in school. So when I went to get my ultrasound for once ever, because almost like you you have ultrasound techs and then you have radiologists that are actually like MDs or DOs that are doctors. So um, usually you'll have an ultrasound tech, which they're also, if they've been trained to interpret results and everything, they're awesome because they focus on specifically that. Um, but I just so happened to have the actual radiologist that was doing my ultrasound and we did abdominal and then trans transvaginal just like um, I had done a couple years ago. But he was actually able to like tell me everything he was seeing right there on the screen. So typically what happens is they take all the images while you're in the room and they don't really say much to you at all. What happens is you do the imaging, they say, okay, we're gonna take some time to get the results and then we'll let you know when we have the results. But because I was in med school and we were kind of talking about that, he was like, okay, well, let's, let's talk about the things that I'm seeing so you can actually process them and know what's going on and know what they look like. Um, so he actually showed me my ovaries and um, he looked at him, he was like, mm, and I told him, you know, I told him about my history as well and how I had the PCOS appearance on the left and like just the issues that I'd been having and the pain that I had that previous December, everything. And he's looking, he's kind of going back and forth and he was like, okay, so let's start with the right ovary because that's the one that's closest to normal. And he looked and he let me see my ovary and I could see all the little like follicles, AKA like cysts. I could see all the follicles and he said, Typically, I want to see eight to 12. He's like, eight to 12 is normal. Typically, I want to see eight to 10 follicles there to know that you don't have too many, um, which too many would, when you be, would be when you start to get polycystic. And I think my right ovary had like around 10. We counted them, had around 10. And he was like, okay. He was like, that's, that's kind of pushing it, but it's not... Um, something that, you know, I'm necessarily worried about. It would be something that, you know, you just check every year when you come to your appointment, just make sure nothing's crazy is happening. If you don't have any other symptoms, then you're good anyway. Then he was like, okay, your right, your left one is a little bit different. So let's look at your left ovary. And he showed me and it did look a little bit different. It looked like there were more follicles and they were like actually bigger. So my right ovary had a more like appropriate look where it's like, there was one one that was mainly bigger than the other ones and then it kind of had the thing where it's like small small getting bigger getting bigger and now it's bigger um but my left was kind of like there was a lot more of them that were more similar in size which again remember when i was talking about when you have like cystic ovaries and your body doesn't know when to ovulate sometimes it's because you have too many follicles that are like the same size and your body doesn't know which one to put to pop like it's just like ah. So it looked like the follicles were a little, there were more of them that were the that were similar in size than on the right. And I think he was saying that I was, I had probably about 12 of them. So that's the far, far end of what would be normal. And I remember him saying too, that he's not sure if he's actually counting them all because he's doing this live. It's not like he's like taking the still images that he took and really interpreting them before he sends them to me like he's looking at this live with me and he's trying to count you know as the screen is moving not with the still pictures but as the screen is moving so um he wasn't even sure if he was counting them all but he was just like okay the left has me more concerned for cysts cyst, or having cystic ovary but he was like at the end of the day um the cycles that you have are not too crazy um you don't have any other symptoms I wouldn't say you have PCOS, but I would say that your ovaries are a little bit more cystic than I would like to see and the left one is borderlining the, that polycystic. And I was like, oh, okay. But then he also said something really important that was important then for a different reason and it is, was important this year for a totally different reason. Um, but he said that he saw something small. Um, I think it was like a over one by one centimeter in size, um, what he said looked like a hemorrhagic cyst. And I'm gonna look at it right here and I'm gonna also pull it up for you guys. Um, 
Yeah, so he saw a cyst. He saw something that looked like a larger cyst and he said that it's most likely hemorrhagic. That's gonna be really, really important later and it directly ties to my endometriosis and what ended up being an endometrioma. Um, but at that time, because he saw that hemorrhagic cyst, he said that that pain that I had on my left side may have very well been a hemorrhagic cyst that had ruptured because at that point I hadn't gotten an ultrasound for like two and a half years or two, two years over two or yeah, over two years. So there was a good chance that maybe that hemorrhagic cyst had ruptured and I had a little bit of internal bleeding and that's why I was in so much pain and it was radiating all up and down my body depending on how big that cyst could have been um, would have determined like how much blood or fluid had bit ruptured into my pelvis. And when you have free fluid in your pelvis that's not supposed to be there, whether it be blood or something else, it can cause a lot of inflammation and a lot of severe pain. So that's what we thought to that moment. But he told me, he was like, you know, most of the time, it's very rare that hemorrhagic cysts really rupture. Most of the time they go away on their own. And he was saying, this is probably a remnant of the last cyst that you had that ruptured but now it started to fill with fluid a little bit again, but it should go away on its own. Um, and that was a fair assessment at the time. But you also see he wrote on the notes that there is that I, that I might have PCOD based off of the way my ovaries look, were, were looking. And that was essentially um, basically what he was telling me. He was like, you're on the verge of that, but I wouldn't be worried about it. Um, and then I had also gotten lab work during these these visits and all my lab work was normal too. So it wasn't anything um, super major to be concerned about. So let's see what happened after that. Okay, so now we have, oh yeah, we're so we're in 2021. So at this point, this was in April of 2021. All the rest of 2021 was super good. Um, honestly, the next year almost was, next 11 months <laughs> was, um, super good um my cycles actually continued to get shorter i had started doing some at-home treatment so i started doing because on one of these lab results i also ended up being like vitamin d deficient which i actually think i had done some research and i saw that there was a link between vitamin d deficiency and um pcos so like some stuff kind of fit in together and I was just like I'm trying to remember but I had started taking these natural supplements which included um vitamin d3 which is just active vitamin d so you don't have to like worry about having to go into the sun for your body to take regular vitamin d and like make it into the vitamin that actually works in your body which is a thing um but you can take it directly in its active form and then I took um what is it myo my is myo de chiro inositol i'll have to put the information up here somewhere i'm not going to get into that because that's a whole different conversation in itself but i was basically looking up remedies to deal with cystic ovaries and how you can still regulate your hormones i don't know what the effect of those supplements were on my endo um if i find out what it is i'm gonna literally put it at the, like the bottom of this video like while i'm talking um because i actually didn't even think about doing that since it was in the past and i had taken the supplements back then but i'm not sure if it could have like worsened or helped my endo i have no idea so i have to actually um check that out but i started taking that and i thought it was one other thing honestly um maybe it was just a multivitamin that i was taking but yeah, and that actually, believe it or not, got my cycles down to my average cycle was about 33 days long. So that's the shortest they've ever been. That's the closest to the average of 28 that they had ever been. So I was really happy about that. Um, I did notice that about every third period I had, though, within that like 11 month time frame, every like third or so period I had was really, really um, painful or where I'd like lose my appetite. I would be nauseous, which was new for me. Um, again, my bleeding has always been normal. I, uh, people that have endo, a lot of times they have that heavy, heavy bleeding because of the tissue, but we might get to why I didn't really have a bleeding issue. I think it has to do with the type of endometriosis that I had, but, um, or have had whatever. <laughs> um, 
but basically I um, had normal flow. It was just, I would be in a lot of pain and it'd be hard to sit down. Because again, the one thing that did never go away with my periods is that extreme um, butt pain. Like literally, if I would stand up too fast, sit down too fast, it would be like, Ugh. but we'll get to that. But like there were certain things that me maybe having polycystic ovaries did not answer. It answered my cycle um, abnormality but it didn't necessarily address like any symptoms that I had on my period. And like, even the st stuff that women with PCOS would talk about, it's like, I only related to kind of like half of it. It wasn't, something always just didn't seem like right. I don't, I don't know, but it just didn't fit all the p puzzle pieces. But um, yeah, so like every third period was kind of like, ugh, ugh. like it would be bad to the point where like, I would go to school and I'd be asking for ibuprofen and What's crazy is like I said, I talk about this in a video that I've already recorded is that like everybody asked for ibuprofen on their period. Like it's so normal, right? So like there was no way for me to know that the amount of pain that I was experiencing would be like the same amount of pain that somebody would like stay at, stay in bed for. Like I thought I was just asking for ibuprofen like everybody else. Every other woman, like she's in this much pain all the time. Like, you know, I just didn't know that there was anything wrong um but yeah so every few periods that's the way it was and um it wasn't until let's see it wasn't until march of 2020 so or 2022 so that is this year so march of this year i had a weird incident so i just wanted to say um if you've watched this portion of my story and my journey thank you so much so so much um and if you are also um finding out that you have endo or you think that you may have endo um definitely give a, give a comment like let me know i would love to talk to some of you ladies about some of the struggles you've had or even the successes you've had different things that you've learned about your journey um i would just love for you guys to share if you liked this video, please like it and support me because I have no idea like how uh, people are even going to ever see this video. <laughs> so like, please like the video if you found it helpful, inspirational, informative, or maybe you just liked hearing me talk. I would love that. And of course, subscribe because I'm going to continue to post videos. I'm going to continue to post about like my actual post-op experience live with my vlog um so well it was live at the time <laughs> with my vlog so um yeah just reach out feel free um to interact with me i would absolutely love that um and then stay tuned for the next part of the endometriosis story